Lovely. So welcome everybody to the second of my, my talks um, on philosophy, the Bible and the problem of evil. Now, um, last time I spoke for um, I think about, about 45 minutes or so um, before we had time for some questions. And um, I'd like there to be maybe a little bit more time for, for questions today, but we'll see how we go. Uh, I, it was really nice, I should say, to get some comments and, and questions and feedback from people about our last talk. Um, and actually quite a few people um, said they didn't mind me talking for as long as I did. I was worried I'd, I was going to go on too long and, and bore people. So um, I'll, I'll talk again for, for, for quite a long time, at least half an hour, um, perhaps more tonight. Then we'll have time for some questions. Um, we probably won't go into breakout rooms. I think it's nice to have a, some central discussion. But um, if you'd much prefer that uh, for, for future sessions or even for tonight, do please send me a message uh, in the, the chat. Excellent. So uh, as usual, we'll just begin by saying um, our opening prayer together, which hopefully... Uh... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you have created us in your image so that we can remember you, know you, and love you. But we are worn away and darkened by sin. We suffer from the evils which we experience ourselves, and we confess the harm which we cause to others. others. In our suffering, we struggle to trust that you draw close to us in love. We cannot know your loving presence until you restore us in your Son, through the power of your spirit. We are not trying, Lord, to understand all of who you are and what you do, for our minds are in no way equal to that. But we do ask to understand a little of your truth, which we believe and love. We hope to learn how you care for us, even when we suffer. We do not seek to understand so that we might believe, but we believe so that we can understand. For we also believe this, that unless we believe, we will not understand. Grant us a glimpse of your wisdom, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady of Unfailing Help, pray for us. St. Anselm, pray for us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So... I'm just going to begin, in case uh, anybody wasn't at the, the last talk, by just very briefly going over um, a few of the themes which we explored then. And once we've done that, I'm going to dive into the topic for tonight's session, which is going to be presenting three different philosophical readings of the book of Job. And each of these readings will give uh, an answer to the problem of evil, uh, a different sort of answer. Um, and so we can use Job as a text, as a way of thinking through some of these new answers to the problem of, of evil and whether or not they might be satisfying for us as Christians, for us as people who are thinking rationally or philosophically, and as people trying to interpret and engage with the, the text of Job. But first, let's just uh, remember some of what we covered last time. So in the last session, I introduced the problem of evil uh, in its many varieties. And I explained that what I'm going to be focusing on in these sessions is what I called the intellectual problem of evil. So that's this, this difficult uh, and challenging question of why a almighty, all-knowing, and perfectly benevolent God can allow evil. And we looked at some different ways in which the, this problem can be raised critically. That's to say it can be raised by atheists asking this question who are actually seeking to, to, to um, propose the answer that God's existence can't be reconciled with the evil which we see. We looked at a couple of different ways in which atheists might develop this critical problem of evil, as I called it. One of which was the logical problem of evil, and that tried to show that it was simply logically inconsistent to claim that evil exists, that God is almighty, 
that he's omniscient, that he knows everything, and um, that he is perfectly benevolent, that he wants the good for his creation. So the logical problem of evil tries to show that those are just logically inconsistent claims. You can't make all of the claims. And because it's obvious that evil exists, therefore we need to reject one of the claims about God. And then having explored some rejoinders to that logical problem of evil, I, I then talked a little bit about what I called the evidential problem of evil, which is probably the most important version of the problem of evil uh, discussed by philosophers today. And this problem of evil, this way of raising the question about the compatibility of God's existence and the existence of evil, doesn't try to show that it's logically impossible that God exists and that evil exists. Rather, it tries to show that evil counts as a really strong sort of evidence against there being an almighty, knowledgeable and perfectly loving or benevolent God. So this is one formulation of that problem here. So the first, the first premise, the first step in the argument points out that for some evils for which we can't think of reasons which would justify God in permitting them. And then the second stage here, EP2, says, well, if we can't think of any reasons which would justify God for permitting those evils, then probably that there aren't any reasons. But then the third stage points out that if God is really omnipotent, omniscient and perfectly good, then he wouldn't permit the existence of any evils unless he had good reason to. And so from if we put this together, together, these premises together, we can conclude that therefore probably there's no omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good being. Okay, there's no God, God as we'd understand him as, as Christians. Okay. Now then we also, we explored a couple of different then rejoinders um, which Christian philosophers have made to the problem of evil. And these were the, th the, free, the, the free will defense and what I call the extended free will defense. And these both talked about human freedom as being something important in a story we can tell about why God does or, or might allow the existence of, of evil. And the idea is that human freedom or um, things connected to human freedom is not something that God can create and maintain unless he also allows the existence of some sort of evils. So first of all, we explored the free will defense itself, which says just that if God determines people's morally significant choices, then that means that they're not free. So if he wants to allow people to make free choices, he has to, he can't determine what people choose. And therefore, if he allows people morally significant freedom with which they can make good or bad choices, then he's sometimes going to have to allow them to make bad choices. So that was one story we looked at for explaining how evil can exist and why God uh, has to allow evil if he's going to allow morally significant human freedom. Then we pointed out that, of course, not all evils are evils which humans choose. So we looked at what I called the expanded free will defense. And this larger story builds on the free will defense by talking about other goods which are connected to free human moral development and which help to explain the existence of evils which aren't things which humans have directly chosen to do. So according to Richard Swinburne, John Hick and some other philosophers, when humans suffer evil, then we can freely develop um, moral character. We can act, for example, with courage in the face of evil, with prudence, with, with temperance. We can develop all sorts of moral virtues. We can develop love and sympathy for other people, and we can, where possible, work to overcome evil. Now, all of those things, all of these virtues just can't exist. Also, the proponent of the expanded free will defense claims without evil 
one can't be really courageous, for example, unless there's something scary okay, to be brave about. One can't really be sympathetic with somebody unless they're in some sort of pain or difficulty. We can't really work to overcome evil unless there's an evil there to overcome. Moreover, the experience, our experience of evil can contribute to our, ability, our moral character and our ability to develop our moral character in other ways. So for instance, our experience of evils which occur in nature gives us valuable knowledge of how we can ourselves cause and prevent evil. And evils which even even evils which lack an apparent purpose, uh, also John Hick argued, are particularly suitable opportunities for us to have sympathy or empathy with people suffering those evils. Um, Hick thought, as I mentioned last week, that if you understood why other people were were suffering evil all the time, then you wouldn't be as sympathetic to them naturally. If you understood, for example, that really it was good good for them to suffer such such evil. So that was the expanded free will defense. And finally, I raised some problems for the defense. Okay, for this story about how God's permission of evil is necessary for human freedom and for human moral development. So first of all, I pointed out that it, it's not obvious, according to the Bible, that God couldn't both create humans with freedom and also ensure how they used that freedom. Okay. If that's true, if God could control what people freely choose to do, then the free will defense kind of collapses because God can could have determined that people both had free will and always chose to do the good. Secondly, it's not obvious with regards to the expanded free will defense that freely formed human virtue, the kind of character I've been talking about, characteristics like courage, empathy, sympathy, is all of that really valuable enough that God is justified in tolerating the existence of the evils which are necessary for it? Is it, for instance, um, enough, you know, justification for God permitting natural disasters that people can struggle bravely through those disasters or even help others in their aftermath? Okay, that's not obvious maybe in fact it you know you, you might be inclined to think the reverse and finally on these stories these defenses connected with free will which i've mentioned we might ask how does god heal the damage which are caused to people who suffer we might think that if god is is really good he'll find a way of making sure that even the suffering which people experienced will directly contribute to their own well-being. And that doesn't look like it's obviously the case on that. either of those stories, the free will defense or the expanded free will defense. Okay. So as I say, I'm not, whilst I think those, those stories about why God might allow evil have some plausibility to them, I don't think that they tell the whole story, and I'm not sure that they constitute entirely adequate replies to the intellectual problem of evil, particularly to the evidential problem of evil. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to explore some more answers to the problem of evil in dialogue with the book of Job. If, if I'd asked, uh, I think, people to choose at random a text, uh, for me to talk about with regards to the problem of evil from the Bible, I suspect that many of you would have recommended the book of Job. Okay, it's the, the biblical text which addresses uh, something like the problem of evil at greater length than, than any other. Uh, and so it's going to serve as a useful foil for, for our discussion. So what, I, what I'll do now is I, I'm just going to spend a little, little bit of time just briefly introducing the book of Job, just in case anybody uh, needs their memory jogging as to sort of what, what the book's about. I'll give a little bit of information about its historical backgrounds and so on. Um, so starting with the historical background first, the, the main thing about the book of Job is that we don't really know a lot. So even in... Um, 
in, even in the ancient world, um, nobody really knew who'd written the book of Job. Some people suggested that Job himself had written the book of Job as a kind of a third, per, third person report on his life. Okay. Um, but even that doesn't really seem consistent with the text because after all, um, uh, you hear about Job's death at the, at the very end of the, the text. Um, and really the, the, there's no clue as to, to who wrote the book. Um, also, we don't really know when this, this book, the book of Job was written. Um, some kind of linguistic evidence uh, indicates that it's relative, might have been written relatively late uh, in the period of the Old Testament. Some people think um, maybe between say the sixth and fourth centuries BC in what's sometimes called the Persian period. Um, to the Persians had, uh, remember, overthrown the, the Babylonians and allowed um, the Judeans to return to their, their home for exile. Um, but when we can't really be, be certain. Um, even more complicated, okay, is the history of how Job might have been written. As, as you might know from some of Father Tim's talks, there's often debates about whether or not individual books of the Old Testament are compositions written by a single author or whether they're amalgamations of different texts and different people have written different bits at, at different points and so on. Now, the latter story on, on which, you know, people are writing different bits of the text is what appears to be true for Job. Um, we're not, can't be certain, but there are two uh, very obvious parts to Job which is that there's a prose kind of framework. There's a, uh, I'll, I'll go through what's in Job in a second, but basically there's a little prologue in chapters one and two. And at the end, there's another sort of half chapter or so of prologue, and all that's written in Hebrew prose, okay? And then in the middle, we have this huge bit of poetry full of different characters giving speeches. So, it sort of looks, so, you know, it's kind of surprising if it's the same author writing these two um, parts, which are in very different style, but of course it's possible that, say, um, poetic form is just a, a really nice way of writing speeches. Okay, so that's, that's uh, you could think that. Um, but even then within both of these sections, the, the framework, we can call it, and then the, the speeches section, there are sort of internal complications and inconsistencies. So for example, in the in, in the prologue, Satan plays an important part as we'll see, and in the epilogue, he's completely fades out of the picture and isn't mentioned at all. Um, and some people then have thought that at some point, maybe that meant that Satan had been added into the prologue to a pre-existing story. Some scholars think that. Again, with the speeches in the middle, the, as we'll see, there's, there's, a, the, there's a cycle of speeches which looks like it makes sense as a literary unit, and then suddenly a, this, a new character, Elihu, bursts onto the scene and gives a, a speech in which he sort of tells off all the preceding characters for having got everything wrong, uh, and then he promptly sort of, um, he stops speaking, and then as we'll see, God appears on the scene, and then God completely ignores everything Elihu said, more or less. So it's possible, for example, that that speech of Elihu uh, and other parts of the, the text have been sort of played about with by later editors or, or authors. So it's, it's um, we don't really know how Job was put together. Uh, scholars kind of try and speculate about which bits maybe came, came first, which bits came later, who would have added in bits and why, um, but really that the text is, is quite fragmentary as we have it. What sort of text is it? Again, that's hard to say. Um, it, it starts off uh, the prologue and epilogue read a little bit like a, a kind of a folk tale with a sort of a moral. And then in the middle, we have these huge, long, big poetic speeches, as I say. Um, some of those speeches contain, if you like, literary forms, types of writing, which are familiar to us from other Old Testament texts. So some of, some of um, Job's complaints read a bit like psalms. They might be supposed to be parodying psalms. And again, there's a chapter in which Job gives a big um, 
speech about wisdom and that's a little bit like some of the the speeches extolling wisdom you find in in proverbs and elsewhere in in the old testament um, in the ancient near east in in the biblical uh, world some of israel's neighbors there were stories um, dating dating back quite a long way uh, back into the second millennium bc about people complaining about suffering from gods debating why they're suffering from gods and things like this so it's possible that there was a sort of genre of text about complaints about suffering which has come from god which job is part of but we we just don't know so so much of job remains an enigma and we'll see at the end of my talk i think that's probably helpful <laughs> um not knowing quite what job means or how it was written is probably part of the the interest of, of the text and something which we're supposed to learn from um, but finally to to move towards the text itself um in terms of its own setting sort of a setting within this the, this story about about job um it's set in what we might call the period of the patriarchs okay the time of abraham uh before you have sort of fixed kingdoms you have people kind of moving around living in sort of small family like groups and so on um, that's the sort of imaginative setting in which this story of Job takes place. Okay, so just in case anybody can't remember the story of Job, I'm just going to go through it really quickly. And then I'm not going to, to read out kind of sample texts from, from Job because we're going to end up looking at some, some particular texts in more detail uh, later. So <clears throat> at the start of Job, we have uh, an introduction and we discover that Job is a Gentile okay he lives in Edom which is a non-Israelite non-Jewish land kind of south of uh, of Jerusalem and he is extremely wealthy and has a large family which in in some ways in the story functions as a, a manifestation of his his wealth and he's extremely pious so when his sons and daughters um have feasts after the feast he says prayers for them blesses them and makes sacrifices just in case they've done anything wrong so that god won't be angry at them or decide to punish them then the scene shifts and we we go up to heaven where god is talking to his angels and a figure called in Hebrew, the Satan, or literally the accuser, who's one of these <clears throat> angelic figures, has noticed Job, and God points him out to, to the accuser, points out Job as, a, as an exemplar of piety, but Satan says that the only reason why Job loves God is, of course, because Job has been blessed with wealth. Uh, and a great family and in fact he said he describes how God has put a fence around Job um, and, and, and his possessions and his family um, in other words they're divinely protected um, we then move so Satan then says um look if we remove this job's wealth then he won't be pious anymore in fact he'll he'll curse you okay he'll curse god that's what satan seems to want job to do but god says no i don't think so. yeah, well he doesn't say so the implication is that god god doesn't kind of call satan's bluff if you like on this and god allows satan to destroy job's wealth and his family and in a sort of series of kind of spectacular disasters um raiders come and slaughter and and steal um job's livestock which is most of his wealth and his family are all sort of celebrating together feasting together as they're accustomed to and then they are they are killed by fire from heaven so everything goes terribly job's family are dead his possessions are all gone but he doesn't curse god so shift to the second scene in heaven satan uh again appears before god in the heavenly court 
and God invites Satan to consider the fact that now Job hasn't abandoned uh, his piety, he's not cursed God, but Satan says, look, that's only because you haven't hurt him himself, you've only hurt uh, the things and people around Job. If, if you really hurt Job personally, physically, bodily, then he will, he will curse you then. His piety will be proved to be a kind of self-seeking sham. And so God allows this to happen too. And Job is afflicted, as you remember, with sores, with sores and, and boils, some sort of skin disease. And he takes himself and sits down in a, in a pile of ashes and laments and three of Job's friends then come come to to visit him and then so this is the point at which we we switch from the prose prologue into the series of poetic speeches and so we start these by Job laments his fate he sort of wishes to be decreated um, using lots of imagery from creation he says he wished he's, he'd never been born and then we have three cycles of speeches, and in the cycle of speeches, Job's three friends, Eliphaz, uh, Bildad, and Zophar, uh, all kind of Edomite, uh, well, broadly speaking, names from people in that part of the world, um, they have these speeches, and uh, basically, this is how the dialogue goes. The friends, in turn, encourage Job to confess some sort of sin, and they are, if you like, upholding a traditional sort of theology, which is found in parts of Psalms and Proverbs in the wisdom literature, according to which, if things go badly for you, that's because God's punishing you. If things go well for you, it's because you've done well, you've done the right thing, you've been wise, and you've secured God's reward. And so the way to stop divine punishment is confession of sin, or so the, the friends claim. But Job rejects this because he says, I haven't done anything wrong. And he becomes sort of increasingly frustrated both with the, the friends and also with God. And so he called God, uh, if you like, to come and answer for why he's doing this to Job. Um, he summons him to something a little bit like a, a law court. Um, but at the same time, he's aware that this is very dangerous because God... Uh, is much more powerful than he is. God, if you like, will be both uh, judge, jury, and executioner. So he's aware that this is a dangerous business. Um, his his Job in, in chapter nine. Indeed, I know that this is so, but how can a mortal be just before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand. He is white in heart, Sorry, he is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted him and succeeded? He then continues later in the chapter. Though I am innocent, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I summoned him and he answered me, I do not believe that he would listen to my voice, for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let me get my breath, but fills me with bitterness. If it is a contest of strength, he is the strong one. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am innocent, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. So that's Job. And there are three cycles of each of the thrones in turn, trying to give Job advice, which becomes increasingly angry on their part that he should confess his sin. And in turn, Job violently replies to each of them saying that he's innocent um, and he asks sort of or wishes that God would appear and somehow explain his actions. Um, in the final cycle this series breaks down because Zophar who you'd expect to have a final speech doesn't get one instead Job has an extra long speech and some people think that part of what Zophar was saying ended up getting placed on the lips of Job but anyway, after Job's um, final speech in this series of speech cycles, uh, a new person called, a young man called Elihu turns up and he, re he rebukes Job and everybody else and says, I've got the answers, if you like, here it is. But actually, 
as most scholars point out, the answers which he gives are fairly similar in large part to the answers which, which the friends have given, namely that Job is being presumptuous, that he must have sinned somehow, that um, suffering is the result of divine punishment. Um, Elihu says a few different things which we'll explore later towards the end of his speech, but that's most of the first part of his, his speech, which goes on for several chapters. And finally, right at the end of the book, God appears, and he appears famously in a whirlwind, and he gives two speeches. And these speeches, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a second, they talk of God's power and care for creation, even and particularly over fierce wild animals like the Leviathan and the Behemoth, these kind of two um, amazing, perhaps mythic creatures. And Job responds to the first speech of God by being silenced. And then in the second speech, he seems to somehow repent or regret what he's done. There's this very difficult phrase to translate in um, chapter two, verse six, saying that Job repents in dust and ashes. I'll come back to that phrase because it's not entirely sure what, what Job uh, is saying or doing there, but it looks like in some way Job regrets what he, he, he's, he's done and he acknowledges that he somehow hasn't spoken entirely rightly. He says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Uh, that's quoting what God was saying about Job. Therefore, I have understood what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. Uh, again, that's quoting God. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job repents, but then the poetry stops. And in a surprising sort of turnaround in the epilogue, Job is actually immediately vindicated. God says, Job, you spoke correctly of me, but your three friends, and Elihu, Elihu the young guy is never mentioned, but your three friends didn't speak correctly. So um, you need to intercede for them for me to forgive them, okay? Returning to this traditional theme that the idea of sorry, that punishment is, um, uh, sorry, the suffering is, is punishment from God. And God and Job um, makes sacrifices for the friends, so they're restored. And then also all of Job's wealth is restored twofold. Um, he gets a new larger family and he gets even more wealth. And so the story ends with Job living, if not happily ever after, um, at least as it, as the text ends, and Job died old and full of days. Okay, so it's it's a long book, Job, and I'm aware that was a slightly dry summary, but I just wanted us to have that overarching story in mind now when we look at three different philosophical interpretations um, of the uh, problem of evil and Job. Sorry, I just, I'm just going to very briefly zoom out. Okay. I'm talking for a little bit longer than I meant to do. All right, let's see what we have time to do. If we don't have time to do all of these, that's okay. Okay, so according to quite a number of readers, if the text is aiming to, if this text were aiming to answer the problem of evil, okay, it just fails. Job doesn't provide any, any good answers to the problem. One way of seeing this is by considering whether or not Job can answer the what we could call a particular problem of Job's suffering. Here's a, a way of, of raising that problem as follows, okay? So um, imagine things are like this. Imagine, one, we can't discover any God-justifying reasons for God's permitting Job's suffering in the book of Job. So then you might think, well, in that case, probably there aren't any God-justifying reasons for Job's suffering in the book of Job. But we might think that if an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly God, sorry, perfectly good God existed, he wouldn't permit any suffering unless he had a good reason for permitting it. And therefore, you might think within the text, within the book of Job, just as a text, you might think it's evident that there's no omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good God. In other words, you might think that if 
um, the book of Job itself um, provides an instance of suffering. You might think that actually this just generates a new version of the problem of evil. Okay. Job, anybody you might think who wants to affirm the truth of or, or the usefulness of the book of Job and also to claim that God is omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good, then maybe has some sort of a problem. Okay. And philosophers who make this claim, who say that Job doesn't answer the problem, even of Job's suffering, kind of make two, two main, main points to support their, their analysis. So firstly, they say something like this. Um, first of all, they say that the prologue itself, that introduction to the story, doesn't provide any reasons which justify God in permitting God's suffering. And to make this point, here's, here's a quotation from um, a play about the book of Job by, by the poet Robert Frost. God, I'm going to tell Job why I tortured him, and I trust it won't be adding to the torture. I was just showing off to the devil, Job, as is set forth in chapters one, one and two. Do you mind, Job? No, no, I mustn't. To assume in a few. I expected more than I could understand, and what I get is almost less than I can understand. In other words, um, you might think placing a, placing a bet, showing off to the devil, as Robert Frost puts it here, is no good reason for God to allow Job to suffer. So you might think if that's the, the reason for Job's suffering, as the text presents it, that you might think then uh, the Job sorry, the God that we read of in Job just isn't um, perfectly benevolent, okay? Something morally amiss, there's something morally amiss with that God. And secondly, philosophers who kind of adopt this reading of Job, this kind of critical reading of Job, say that God's speeches also don't give Job good reason to repent, to change his mind, to, if you like, withdraw his accusation that God's being unfair to him. Um, Wes Morriston, for example, characterizes God's speeches to Job as follows. He says, well, in the speeches, God shows that he's more powerful than Job. Okay, and particularly, he can, he can create the world and he can control all sorts of wild animals. Secondly, it shows that he's wiser than Job. Job doesn't know how to do creation. And thirdly, he says it shows that a particular ordering of, of creation for which God's responsible. But Morriston says, if these things, these three things taken together, don't provide any explanation of why Job suffers or why they're suffering at all. So here's Wes Morrison, uh, an American philosopher. To some readers, it will seem that God has merely changed the subject. Uh, this is in his, in his speeches, asserting what Job has known all along, that he is the supremely wise and powerful order of a magnificent cosmos. How is this supposed to take care of Job's complaint? And in fact, in a later article, Morriston, the philosopher, suggests that the point, the answer which Job gives, is that God doesn't have an answer because God isn't really benevolent, okay, uh, or just in the way in which God and even his friends assume. So he writes this, he writes, throughout his ordeal, Job had clung to the hope that justice could be found somewhere, if not in God, then in some higher court of appeal. But now, having stood face to face with the ultimate, he knows what a mad and senseless hope this had been. There is no court of appeal and no law requiring justice of God. Okay, according to Morriston, that's what we're supposed to learn from the book of Job. To see why this is the case, let's just look at really quickly. Uh, I know I'm going over time as usual. A couple of um, a couple of passages from Job. Here's firstly something not from God's own speech, but from Elihu and his speech. Here's what Elihu says. See, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Okay, very good. And quite similar to what God says later. Who has prescribed for him his way? Or who can say you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work of which mortals have sung. All people have looked on it. Everyone watches it from far away. Surely God is great and we do not know him. The number of his years is unsearchable. So you might think that on Elihu's telling, God is so powerful that we can't really know what he's like. In fact, his power seems to be connected to his ability to decide what's right or wrong. Okay, After all, who can say to God, you have done wrong? Well, if, if that's all true, this seems 
perilously close to saying that God can be morally justified or justified in some moral sense in doing what he likes just because he's really powerful. If you like, God doesn't measure up to ordinary human standards of morality. So that we could, for example, describe him, describe him as perfectly benevolent. And here's a, another um, a similar thought, but this is actually on God's lips. Uh, when this is from uh, Job, uh, God's second speech to Job, he begins his speech by saying, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Now, the Hebrew there is is an uh, ancient title of God's, El, Sh El Shaddai. But if we translate that literally as, it, or sorry, in the way in which the rabbis and others typically translated it as the Almighty, you might think, in other words, how can anybody find anything wrong with somebody so powerful? And then God continues, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me so that you may be justified? And then he immediately continues, have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? Now, if you like a, a certain sort of reading of this text, then would say, well, what God's saying is because he's so powerful, God can't question him morally. His very power makes him it's somehow illegitimate for Job to uh, ask sort of moral questions about justice of him, um, whether that's because he just isn't just, um, moral categories don't apply to him, or perhaps because uh, you might think on, on God's view or on Elihu's view, simply being powerful gives you the right to, um, as it were, dictate the moral landscape so that you don't have to be answerable to claims of, of justice from your inferiors. Okay. So I think it's obvious that this sort of reading of Job doesn't solve the problem of evil. Okay. In fact, it's just a more, it's just another way of pressing it. It's just another way of saying, after all, God in Job isn't perfectly benevolent, even if he is perfectly knowledgeable and powerful. Okay. Um, I want to explore then a couple of alternatives to this suggestion in the time which I've got left. And sorry, I went on longer than I wanted to in the, the start of uh, my presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking, I think, till, till, I'm, till I'm, I, I'm more or less done, but we'll, we'll see. I might have to skip over some things. So first of all, um, the lady who you can see on the screen is a Catholic philosopher called Eleanor Stump, and she's extremely influential, um, or ha has been in the last couple of decades in philosophy of religion. Uh, and in particular, she's got a, a very famous book, which I've put up a picture of there, Wandering in Darkness. And in a way, if I recommend a, a book for anybody to read on the problem of evil, simply uh, in virtue of its elasticity of thought, its engagement with biblical texts, um, its kind of deep thoughtfulness and insight, it would be this one, even though I don't entirely agree with what Stump has to say, I think. So Stump gives us a different reading of the book of Job. And on Stump's reading, we do actually get an answer to the problem of evil and suffering in the book. Okay, in stark contrast to Wes Morriston and some atheist philosophers. Now, Stump shows this in two ways. First of all, she starts by exploring Satan's dialogue with Job. Uh, let's look, sorry, I forgot. Oh. Ah, uh, this is an important point. Paul has just asked me whether I'm intending to share my screen. I am intending to share my screen. Can anybody not see my screen? Uh, if anybody can't see this, my screen, could you type in the chat, please? Because that probably means I've just been talking without anybody seeing anything for a long time, which would be a bit worrying. Paul can't see my screen. Can anybody else not see my screen? Otherwise, this has probably been an extremely confusing uh, presentation. Um, perhaps it's just Paul. Just ignore me then. Oh, so I'm very sorry about that, Paul. No, don't, don't worry about it. I, I was, if, if no one could see it, I thought I would, that was why I raised the point. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, hopefully other people can. Uh, I don't quite know why, why Paul... Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't think I can fix it. Um, Please easily. don't worry. Please carry on. You're short of time. Okay, yeah, I am very short on time. So, um, in fact, hang on. I'm just going to do this just to see how much time I'm going to very briefly. Yeah, OK, I'm very short on time. All right, uh, let's let's go back. I'll, I'll go back to, to showing my screen. Sorry. Um, let's try to see how much time I had. Not a lot. OK, 
So in Wandering in Darkness, Stump argues that God does provide an answer to the problem of Job's suffering. And she starts this answer by exploring Satan's dialogue with Job. Now, on Stump's reading, Satan isn't just an angel. He's an alienated member of God's family, uh, and he's a cynical one. In fact, let's go move now to the text, okay? So this is, this is the start of, 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 uh, of the scene when we first meet Satan in Job. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, the Hebrew there translated as heavenly beings is literally sons of God. And Stump takes this in a sort of literal sense. She says, somehow these angelic beings are in an analogous sense members of God's family. So they're not just uh, angels who happen to be floating around or happen to be subject to God. They're important to him. They should be close to him like children to their parents. And then the Lord asks Satan, where have you come from? And Satan says that he's been coming, he's come from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down upon it. Now on Stump's reading, God doesn't ask this because he needs, okay, to know where Satan's been. Of course he knows where Satan's been. Or even as a narrative device, he asks this because Satan has been walking up and down. Satan literally, as I said before, means the accuser. Satan has been walking up and down, uh, Stump speculates, in order to disrupt God's work, in order to hurt people or accuse them of things, okay, to do bad things. So when God asks Satan where he's been, it's a little bit like asking, um, I don't know, uh, a teenager who has been out doing something they shouldn't have been, okay? He's drawing Satan's attention to the fact that God knows what Satan's been, been up to, okay? He's raising, he's raising this, this difficulty that's, there's, a, there's enmity between God and Satan, even though Satan is in some sense his, his son. <clears throat> now, um, he then points out this figure of Job, and Stump says what God is doing here is he's trying to show Satan, if you like, a, a more positive example. Okay, he's trying to say, look, could well, Stump discusses precisely what he's doing, but one way of reading it would be, haven't you thought about being a little bit more like your brother, okay, <laughs> who hasn't been been out doing bad things, disrupting my work, and so on? And we see immediately that Satan's response is cynical. Satan says that Job doesn't, you know, doesn't just love, love God, okay, for his own sake, he just does it because he receives divine protection. Uh, and that, of course, if he, God stretches out his hand and hurts Job or removes his, sorry, at this stage, just if he removes his possessions, then uh, Job will curse God. And then God permits Satan to destroy his possessions. No, God doesn't do it himself, but he permits it to happen. So Stump says that in doing this, actually, God has got, he's got something of a purpose. And the, the purpose is, it's to try and break through Satan's cynicism. So he thinks Satan's a moral cynic. He says, nobody's good. Nobody loves God for his own sake. And what God's trying to do is trying to show Satan that that's wrong. And in that way, maybe, he will not just kind of triumph over Satan by showing, okay, Satan, you were wrong all along, ha ha, but he'll try and either contribute to making Satan a little bit better or at least stop him getting worse, okay, by showing him that actually disinterested love of God is possible. Okay, so that's part one of, of Stump's explanation. The Stump doesn't just think that God uses Job as an instrument to help Satan. He also thinks that Job's suffering benefits Job, and it does this in three ways. First of all, it deepens uh, and affirms Job's commitment to goodness. That is to say, when Job is charging God with injustice, Job takes the side of justice. He doesn't say, whatever God wants for me is right. He 
shows a commitment to some sort of strong moral standard of justice. And after all, Stump thinks that God, God ultimately is good and he does uphold standards of justice. So actually, in a way, Job gets closer to God and what God cares about through his complaining even. Secondly, any internal ambiguity about Job's motivation for not cursing God, because Job, whilst he complains, he never explicitly sort of curses God, as, as his wife recommends at one stage. Any ambiguity as to his motivations are, are, are removed, his commitment to God is in some sense purified. And then finally, perhaps because of these two positive uh, things, perhaps because his commitment to goodness and to piety are augmented, God, uh, Job eventually gets to see and speak with God at length. Again, hardly anybody else gets to do that in the Old Testament, so that's kind of an amazing thing for Job. Okay, but finally, Stump also thinks that Job gets an answer to his demands for an explanation of what God's doing. Now, you might think this is strange if you've if you've read any of the speeches, and we'll look. Uh, I'm going to stop talking in a second. In a second, but before I do that, we'll we'll just look at a couple of speeches from God, or a couple of parts of God's speeches. In the first part of, uh, sorry, in in one of the, in in God's first speech, God questions Job about whether he can do various things. He asks him. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no further and hear your proud waves be stopped. So I'm sure as many of you will know, sea, water in the Old Testament, it's a, it's a chaotic force. In some ways it symbolizes chaos. But Stump points out that here, chaos isn't a kind of, it's not a monster for God to slay, as you have, as, uh, you have in some other creation stories, even in, which we even see reflected in a few places in the Old Testament. Rather, the sea is something which God treats like a child. Okay, he even, he swaddles it. Um, perhaps in a sense, he even gives birth to it like a mother. Okay, there's maternal imagery here too coming from the, the womb. Um, and at the same time, he cares for other things by making sure that it doesn't go too far. So Stump here says that throughout God's speeches, um, God shows a very intimate sort of parental care for creation. And this creation sometimes involves what she calls second person relationship, an IU relationship with creation. It's particularly true when he talks about the creatures. So with regards to the fierce Leviathan described in God's second speech, God asks Job whether um, the, the Leviathan, well, first of all, whether he can catch it, but then secondly, will it make supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you and be taken as your servant? Can you play with it? In other words, can you relate personally to Leviathan, not just can you slay it or... Uh, have power over it and so on. And in this way, Stump thinks that Job shows, so God shows Job a glimpse of his maternal or paternal care for creation and the, that he's in relationship with all of the individual aspects of creation, almost in an IU relationship, even within inanimate bits of creation like lightning bolts and things and, and, the, and the waters. So Stump concludes that it's a mistake to characterize, so I, I, I won't read the whole quotation, but basically she says it's a mistake to characterize God's speeches to Job as an uncaring demonstration of his power. Rather, they show this sort of second personal relation that he has to all creatures and to the whole of creation. Okay. I know I'm, I'm going very over time. All right. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm Turns out that I've produced a lot too much material for this session. So what I'm going to do, uh, um, I'm going to stop. Uh, how do I stop my screen share? That's what I want to do. Have I stopped? Yes, I have. I stopped my screen share, haven't I? OK, so I'm going to, to stop now. And I'm just going to invite any questions or reflections on what we've had so that people can go at 8 o'clock if they'd like to. I'm sorry that I've gone over by so much. I think what we'll do is next week, I'll continue to reflect on some of these uh, 
readings of, of Job and introduce some material showing how they particularly relate to, if you like, the rest of the problem of evil, not just to the problem of evil in Job. Um, but do we have any sort of questions or comments on what I've done so far? Uh, I'll have a look, quick look in the chat. Let's see. But please, if you've got any thoughts, do add things in the chat. Can you see the chat, right? Yes. So, Breda, uh, thanks, Breda. Breda has just asked uh, the human evil is not just a human problem. Yes, that's right. It seems that evil exists in the natural world, uh, certainly in, in creatures and in their suffering and in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. A significant concern is. Right. Yes, that's right. So I think uh, essentially, Brido, do you want to ask the question in your own words or, or uh, are you happy for me just to, to read it out? Well, I'm happy for you to read it out. It's just that I think the way we're looking at it, especially through the story of Job. Um, can you see me? Or yes, do you hear me? Oh, you can. Um, I've lost sight of everybody. And everything, okay. Um, is it's a very huge. It's a, it's a problem that is the human problem that can we can be intellectual about. It. It's to do with our behaviour. Whereas in fact, suffering, and you may not call suffering evil. Um, evil is has got a particular um, uh, interpretation. But suffering exists, or apparently unnecessary suffering. It's not like when we kill an animal to eat it, and then we just eat it, and it. it it helps us to live. But these creatures who just uh, are born in other other animals and just the other animal just suffers for the duration of that creature's life so that it could come to life. It's just, it just seems hard to explain. And I just wonder whether you're going to look at that. So, yeah, thanks, Breda. And that's really helpful. So you're, it's really good to draw attention to the great variety of evil. And I think, um, you might remember in the, in the first session last time I, I said as I'm talking about evil in these talks I'm taking evil in a very broad sense it's just things not being the way they should be other things being equal so certainly those kinds of evil are kind of included in my concern in these talks now you're right the problem uh, if you like Job's own suffering is one very particular species of, of evil of, of evil which humans suffer and so whilst it's a kind of accessible form of evil which we can maybe empathize with and understand easily it by no means encompasses uh, all the different sorts of evil that are, that, that are. Um, so yes I will be I will be talking uh, a little bit in fact I'd already hoped to talk tonight about okay. some ways in which um, we might respond to the problem of evil more broadly which don't just focus on human suffering yeah i just i haven't got uh anywhere near that as far as i hope to okay thanks uh, yes i know this a lot i know this a lot to get through thank you you know uh, yes we will come back to, to that excellent uh let me have a look i don't know anything else now does anybody else have any comments or questions on on job or anything we've we've heard so far this evening i know that there's i really haven't got very far <laughs> could i ask greg um why does Job have to explain the problem of evil? Um, could it not be that the book is actually about us human beings trying to understand the problem of evil? So I think that's I, so. I think that's a great point, Mike. And in fact, um, it will have to probably be next time now. But that's not far off my own conclusion. <laughs> so I'm not sure. So I agree. Uh, philosophers sometimes or theologians sometimes look to Job for an explanation and answer to the problem of evil. Um, and as I'll, I'll hope to show, uh, I, I didn't have time to finish talking about Stump and her reading of Job. Some philosophers like Stump try to make an answer to the problem of evil, if you like, out of the material in Job, or at least they try and show that what Job says is consistent with their own big answer to the problem of, of evil or, or suffering. Um, now, I'm more skeptical as to whether we can do that. And in fact, there's a, a important philosophical tradition of reading Job as promoting skepticism about our ability to answer these questions. So I certainly think that's a, that's very important and, and, and a valuable way to read Job, thanks. Um, oh, excellent, Anna, do we have uh, uh, Anna next? Uh, and I should say, sorry, it's eight o'clock now. So please, if anybody, uh, if anybody wants to, wants to leave and hasn't already, please feel very free to, to do so. Otherwise, we'll continue talking for a little bit. Um, and it might even be, depending on how many questions that we have, uh, that I can mention a little bit of uh, 
uh, of the extra material I was hoping to cover in my presentation, but we'll see how we go with, with the, the questions uh, first. Uh, but Anna, sorry. Um, I can read out your question if you like, but you're very free to, to ask it yourself. If there were two questions that kind of came up right at the beginning of your talk, um, and I've, I can't see my chat to work out what I wrote down, but one was to do with freedom and this idea that if freedom, if evil exists in the world to allow us to be free, then why is it that there are some times when God divinely intervenes and we don't have that choice? Why is that freedom taken away sometimes? And the second point was about character formation. And I think you made a point about some philosophers argue that we need evil in order to bring about greater, uh, greater goods and get greater characteristics. But surely that's a kind of never ending circle in that cycle in that um, you have somebody who is generous, but then you have people who find more devious ways of exploiting their generosity. Um, so, so it's kind of propagating, you get greater evils and greater goods and greater evils and greater goods. So yeah, just, that's, no, that's right. Thanks, so, but it's both two, two really good questions. Thanks. Uh, so I think my answer, if you like, is, is not to answer because I think that those are both reasonable points which you can make against um, what I call the free will defense and the extended free will defense last time. So it's not entirely clear to me um, that freedom is as much as it's cracked up to be by the people who who put forward those defenses, who tell that story that it's really hu human freedom, either in terms of our ability to make choices to commit uh, evil or our freedom to develop ourselves morally, which really explains God's permission of evil. Uh, the only thing I, I would say, though, is, is this. Um, if you wanted to, to, I think uh, somebody who wants to defend those those defenses, th those explanations for God's permission of evil, they could say something like this. Why does God allow us freedom only at some times? Well, perhaps that's because God knows much more than we do about what sorts of choices we'll make. And whilst maybe he can't determine our choices, he can, he can do a best shot and he can give us the best chance of exercising uh, our choices well. And it might be then they could say that the occasions on which we see God permitting us to have free choice, those are only the cases on which God has the best chance at producing good results, even if he can't always produce good results. And I think they'd say something similar with regard to your point about character, about sort of um, people forming a uh, bad character. Uh, as a result of having freedom. I think they'd say something like this, yes, that's that's true, and God can't exclude that possibility, but nevertheless, um, to, to kind of quote the <laughs> Barack Obama, I think, sort of the, the uh, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice or whatever. So God, uh, uh, some way providentially and probabilistically ensures that people on the whole make good choices. Um, I'll, I'll just mention one way in which this is supposed to work. J John Hick, you remember one of the people who I talked about last time who proposed the or defended um, what I've called the extended free will defense. He was a universalist. That's to say he thought that everybody would ultimately end up in heaven. And he, to try and explain how this would happen and yet how we'd also be free to, to choose to go to heaven, he thought that effectively you, you'd have a sort of a, uh, a long series of, of different afterlives, okay, on which people would be given more and more opportunities under increasingly favorable circumstances to form themselves properly, uh, to have a relationship with God and heaven. So you could tell stories like that, where eventually over time people make better and better choices. But I agree that in our experience of, sadly, our experience of, of life more general, it's not obvious that people are making better and better choices over time. So I, I'm not very happy with that, that answer. Um, but yeah, I think those are excellent points to make against these free will defenses. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add or... So is Hicks um, view there uh, something like purgatory? Uh, sorry, say again, Philston. Sorry, so is that rather like purgatory? Uh, yes, that's uh, right. So similar, sim but it, it's a kind of a corkscrew purgatory. Uh, well, no, or maybe that's not quite right. Yes, so it kind of keeps going round and round. You might have multiple lives, and uh, every, everybody gets into purgatory. That's sort of the, the difference between kind of Hicks view and just the modern version of purgatorio, the Dante, I'm sure. Yeah, so I mean, it's something so it, it's very similar to purgatory. In fact, it's inspired by Origin and his idea of kind of purgatorial uh, sufferings after after death. 
That's right. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Could you just, if, you, if there isn't anything else, could you just carry on a little bit with your, what you're going to say about Eleanor Stump? And I'm not quite sure now how this, I rather like this idea of the I thou relationship that, that you are, she's developing, but how does that answer uh, Job's uh, problem with his innocent suffering? Yeah, right. So maybe um, I know that this is a little bit naughty. I'm, I'm going to steal time from, from the questions. I know there's a couple of things. Uh, I don't know if Breda still, I don't know, Breda, do you still have your hand up or is that from your previous previous question, maybe? Um, but in, in any case... Sorry, please. that was a, that was a, from the previous one. I, yeah. I wanted to draw attention to Anna's question about... Um, uh, why is Job, if he's not a, if he's a Gentile, why is he in the Hebrew scriptures? Uh, okay, yes, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer that uh, briefly, and then I'll, I'll go back to to, uh, to 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 stump if I may. Yeah, so um, and, and I know that Mike's got a question, but I might be able to come back to that afterwards. So um, yeah, with regard to Job being a Gentile, uh, there's no obvious reason in, in the text. I mean, one thing it might do is a, a lot of these the questions and the, uh, and the answers which people have in Job are very controversial. So one nice thing that it does, if you're an author, it slightly distances Job. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a little bit more okay for Job to be more daring in confronting God if he's not an, uh, an Israelite or one of the, the patriarchs. Um, but other than that, I'm not entirely sure. I think the, the land of Edom where it said was supposed to have a reputation for wisdom and for wisdom literature. And these questions which come up uh, are part of, uh, related to probably to, um, yeah, to, to this group sometimes called the wise who write texts like Proverbs and of Psalms and so on, uh, who really are kind of in, probably groups of scribes, but who had a kind of international presence. So it might be that uh, that's one reason why it's a particularly suitable setting. Of course, there's nothing of in general, though, against, um, in, 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 you know, which absolutely prohibits in the Hebrew Bible people who aren't Jewish from having a relationship with God. Um, and so I, I think this is sort of one of those interesting examples of, if you like, a kind of a, a, a non-Jewish, well, perhaps not quite a saint, but something along those, those lines, a holy person. Sorry, I don't know if Father Tim has anything to add on that before I will go back to start briefly. Well, I was rather distracted from Tanya's um, question earlier, um, because uh, I, I think um, you're quite right about, it. well, the main point is, at Anna's point, that it does seem to be, uh, Job does seem to be a Gentile, certainly whenever uh, it's, uh, Edom is one possible location. I think the text actually says the land of Uz. And I looked this up on Wikipedia, which is so wonderful, of course, <laughs> because all the answers. And there, Edom is just perhaps one suggestion of where. Oh, okay. And in mod uh, one interesting, um, uh, you know, modern Hebrew is really a reinvented language in the 19th century onwards. But when they translated the Wizard of Oz into Hebrew, they translated Oz as Uz. So us could be simply the land of Oz. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's, that's a little bit joking, but nevertheless, wherever, wherever this is, it does seem to be a Gentile. But the main point I think is that Job, whatever he is, is blameless and upright, all those things and fears God. Yeah, as you, you're saying, Greg, really. Um, but it, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, I keep, do please go, keep going. I was just uh, getting up there. I finished really. Uh, I, was just, I just think it's very interesting uh, as well, but um, we can go back to stump and, uh, and um... yeah don't worry sorry I'll just take five five minutes more of everybody's time then we'll have more time for questions so I'll, I want yeah here we go so we we saw according to stump in, in God's speeches God reveals a kind of maternal or paternal care he has a sort of IU relationship a second personal relationship with creation okay now how does this then what does this have to do with the problem of evil more more generally or how does it help job in in particular okay so I'll, I'll i think here on the slides i discuss the problem of evil more generally but we can kind of apply it to, to job in particular by going back okay so stump develops what she calls a, a sometimes a thomistic defense that's to say a, a a defense and explanation of why god allows evil which draws on the thought of aquinas in particular and this this defense if you like this this story which is supposed to not necessarily be absolutely true, but it's at least supposed to be a plausible story, which one could believe. Um, it doesn't aim to explain all sorts of suffering. It, it aims to, or evil, it aims to ex explain one type in particular, and that's the 
uh, suffering of mature um, human adults who don't have uh, mental disabilities um, or other incapacities of that sort. Okay, so start starts by by asking. Sorry, I'm aware, I'm aware that we've taken a step back from Job, but we'll come back in a second. What's the best and worst things for human for human beings? And she says that the best possible thing for humans is permanent union, permanent uh, permanent union with God. And by that, she means kind of perfect relationship, in particular, a sort of second person IU relationship where a person knows, loves and has his or her attention focused on God. And then this is mutual. So God knows, loves and has his attention fixed on the person. People see each other as it were face to face. Okay. And the worst possible thing for God, by contrast, is separation from God, is a lack of this union and therefore particularly a per any permanent separation. Okay. Now, Stump then draws on Aquinas' account of original sin, okay, which in, for these for per present purposes isn't going to be especially kind of uh, different from probably quite a popular understanding of original sin, which is to say that human wills, human psyches are somehow damaged so that we don't want to have union with God. Why is that? Well, it's because we prioritize other sorts of goods over a relationship with God. And in fact, th what this also means is that people are on Aquinas psychology kind of fragmented why is that? Well, everybody ultimately, according to Aquinas, desires the good. Okay, this is a kind of Aristotelian idea. Everybody really wants what's good for them. And therefore, also by extension, in fact, that they ought to, and at some deep level, do want permanent union with God. But on the other hand, they also want things that get in the way of union with God. They don't want things, the same things that God wants. And because of this, they become internally divided they're kind of double-minded. On the one hand, they want to be with God. On the other hand, they don't. They have different competing interests. Um, and here, and she, she says that some people don't even want to want union with God. Okay, it's not just that they want union with God and they want other stuff. They don't even want to want union with God. They don't have what she calls the second-order desire for union with God. Okay. So that's some problems to do with human flourishing and what constitutes human, human flourishing. Okay, now she then says, well, what in general would um, allow God legitimately sort of to cause humans or to permit humans to suffer? Well, she says he had to meet two conditions. First of all, the person who's suffering would have to be the main, the primary beneficiary of the suffering. And secondly, the benefit, uh, some benefit, this benefit which would accrue to the sufferer, it would have to be greater than the, the pain of the suffering. And the suffering would have to be necessary, at least kind of the best way of getting the benefit. OK, if that makes sense. Right. OK, sorry. So that's a lot of groundwork. So then what Stump says is this. She says, the reason why God permits the suffering of mature adults is for one of two reasons. OK, either is to ward off the worst possible evil by encouraging them to surrender resistance to desiring relationship with God. Um, let me put it this way. On Stump's kind of Thomistic psychology, nobody who doesn't want to want union with God can want to want union with God themselves. Okay, that's a gift which has to come from God. But what you can do is you can stop resisting wanting to want union with God. <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. In other words, once you stop resisting God, once you stop resisting relationship with him, you will end up wanting relationship with him and stunts account. So one reason why God allows people to suffer is because she thinks in some ways it helps them to stop resisting relationship with God. On the other hand, another reason for people who are already in relationship with God, he says it allows them to deepen their relationship with God. Um, how does it do that? Well, one thing that it might do is it might somehow make them psychologically more integrated. As we saw, uh, as I mentioned earlier, inner psychological fragmentation prevents union with God or with other people because you're not even united to yourself. If you have different incompatible desires, if you want to present different images of yourself to the world, 
and the extent to which you can relate to other people, and especially to God, is impaired. So some thinks that somehow suffering can also lead to a kind of psychological integration, and particularly a kind of integration around a love of what's good and what God values. Okay. Now, this is all extremely vague, and one of the most frustrating things about Stump's account is she never tells you precisely how all of this is supposed to work. Okay, she gives some quotations. Here's a quotation from Aquinas, unsurprisingly. It says, as water extinguishes a burning fire, so tribulations extinguish the force of concupiscence, so that's kind of disordered desires, so that humans don't follow them at will. Therefore, the church is not destroyed by tribulations, but lifted up by them. And in the first place, by the lifting up of the mind to God, as Gregory, uh, that's not me, that's Pope Gregory, <laughs> says, the evils which bear down, uh, bear us down here drive us to God. Okay. So, and she also, she mentions various kind of parts of psychology, uh, modern psychology and research where people suffering kind of traumatic experiences somehow can experience psychological growth. Okay. And so these, this is why God allows suffering in general. And so let's just quickly, I'll just go back and apply this to Job. Okay. So in Job's case, if you remember, uh, go back here. Stom thinks that Job gets prepared to see God by his suffering. And he's prepared because in his suffering, he reaffirms his commitment to goodness. He becomes kind of single handed and sort of obsessed with goodness and God's goodness and justice, even if it means that he's going to accuse God of not being good or just or kind of seek uh, to take God to court where he's going to get an explanation. Um, and, in, and in this way, this is the primary way anyway, in which God think, sorry, Stump thinks that Job gets prepared for this point where he sees God. And when he sees God, he thinks, in, in the speeches, he has this second person encounter with God. And he, Stump says that basically this encounter, but like having a conversation with somebody and seeing them in the flesh as opposed to on Zoom, says you can't really sum up what that was like in a speech, okay? As readers, we don't know what that was like and we can't expect it. We get a glimpse of it. We get a glimpse of it in God's second hand relationship, sorry, second person relationship with the creation, which he, God describes, but we don't really know what it was like. And she thinks it's that experience of experiencing a loving God who cares for him in a second personal way that answers the problem for Job. But if you like, we don't get the full answer because we're not having that experience with God. We only get a kind of a, a hint of it, a hint of God's providential care. All right, sorry, I'll stop sharing now, but hopefully that gives you a little sense of what Stump, what Stump thinks. Um, maybe I'll, I'll invite questions on that. And just as you're thinking of questions for that, um, I'll, I'll just pose a few, you know, here are some things which I think we might worry about, okay, with regard to this account. So there's quite a few. So one of them in effect has come up already. So this, first of all, this doesn't explain all sorts of other kinds of evil, okay? So it only deals with the problem of suffering for, and only then as far as um, kind of mature, um, mentally capable adults are concerned. So that's one big problem with it. Another difficulty is this, we might just ask, is it really credible to think that suffering on the whole produces kind of psychic psychological integration? Does it generally lead people to kind of um, a deep affection or commitment to justice and the good? That's hard to say. Uh, in response to that worry, basically Stump says, well, I don't know, and you shouldn't expect to know either. So for all you know, suffering is really the best tool that God has for guiding people towards kind of integration and uh, with themselves and then in various ways preparing them for relationship with him um, uh, i'm just you know i just think we have reason to be skeptical about that though sometimes suffering seems to overwhelm people and destroy them um, in awful ways so i'm i'm not sure if that's true um it is his just one final problem which i want to reflect on um now obviously different cultures have different sort of um religious traditions and maybe some cultures as a whole some societies are, as a whole are more spiritually healthy than others However, within a society, within most societies, you expect to have a fairly large range of people in different spiritual conditions. Okay, who are open to experiencing God in to different, you know, experiencing relationship with God to different extents. But of course, we know that suffering is not equally distributed over all societies, cultures, different parts of 
uh, the world different classes, okay, uh, all sorts of different um, ways of dividing up people. And so if God is really always just providentially guiding suffering so that people get the best shot at forming, uh, growing uh, so that they um, become capable of relationship with him, it's a bit surprising that, say, you know, earthquakes only strike uh, certain bits of the world, and then in England we're relatively safe from natural disasters and so on. You might expect a very, all things considered, even distribution of suffering, and unless, of course, God has favourites and he just really wants to inflict suffering on some people so that they grow more than, than others. I don't know. Anyway, so but I, but there's more problems which we could mention, but we might have thoughts about Stump. Uh, let's have a, I'll have a quick look in the chat now, sorry. Uh, While you're looking at it, can I just say I, I, I had lots of the questions that you have raised, but another thing is um, if the best thing is for us to have union with God and see him face to face, um, I think the book of Job, that prose begins uh, with Job being upright and uh, fearing God and so on. So, so if anybody, or well, there are a few others in the Old Testament, but if anybody is already in that uh, condition of that perfect almost I thou relationship with God, it's Job. So then still, why does why not only why does this innocent man suffer, but why well he's innocent, he's totally innocent because he, he is in this uh, right relationship with God. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I think what Stump though would say, uh, and what she does say is that actually he wasn't as close to God as he thought, maybe. Maybe he he was he was quite close to God, but he after all. Uh, I mean, for, for one thing, maybe maybe he'd misunderstood what God was like. Maybe he thought that he believed in this kind of retribution theology of Proverbs, that God always punished the innocent. And that's one way in which he, he certainly radically misunderstood God. And maybe also his commitment to God's goodness and justice was somehow, um, I don't know, at least it was vague, it was wishy-washy, it had never been put to the test. I don't know. Maybe that's not a plausible story, but that's what she'd maybe, say. Maybe, as you say, maybe. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but maybe not. No, indeed, exactly. And there's a lot of a lot of speculation here. Um, let me have a quick look through uh, some of these these questions we've got. Uh, yeah, Paul points out that suffering often drives people to savagery, and I think that's right. It's not at all clear to me whether or not Stump is right to think that suffering does produce openness to God or a need to other people more generally. Um, oh, let's see, Helen. Helen, do you have a question? Sorry, I know, but we've got some questions from... I'm trying to give everybody a chance to have a question if they can. Yeah, I, I feel that one of the problems, if you like, with a lot of these responses to suffering is that it's somehow trying to shift the blame for suffering away from human beings. And onto God or trying to explain why God's not to blame but it's still not really addressing who is to blame because I think a lot of I think a, a lot of suffering in the world actually is our responsibility so and, and a lot of it is um, kind of so ingrained that it's, it's almost like structural sin that that causes a lot of evil and suffering so i went to a, a talk last monday for example and um it was a phd student at durham whose research is looking at the work of somebody called judith butler i think she was called who's some kind of social scientist and and he's talking about how you know the, the notion of freedom and how actually freedom is um nobody's as free as as we'd like to think that we are because we're very much constrained by our upbringings by the social constructs in which we find ourselves and um, so our ability to choose is is actually quite limited by what's around us but a lot of what's around us is based on the actions of those who've gone before us. It's based on the structures that have been set up, which perhaps are not always morally very good in themselves. So actually, if we want to relieve a lot of suffering, whether we think it is, um, is caused by directly by humans or by even by natural evil, then actually the answer to that suffering lies with us as human beings, because you know natural disasters and things like that as you said, Greg, do affect some parts of the world 
more than others. But the reason for that is because the rest of us are allowing that to happen. We're allowing people to live in flood risk areas. We are not, you know, there's enough food on the planet for everybody, but we're not sharing it. We're allowing those sort of structural injustices to continue. So, you know, I, I, I sort of feel that a lot of these responses to evil, if you like, maybe we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Maybe we should just be saying, right, okay, well, evil is there largely because of humanity and what is humanity going to do about it? Because if, if we believe in a God who is in relationship with us, then that God doesn't want to control us but does want us to freely choose good. And that cuts across every level of decision-making. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And so I think really valuable points there, Helen, about, yeah, about human responsibility for, for evil, which, as you say, is often structural. Um, I would just say, though, that I don't... So I think that, as I, I, I think, I, maybe I tried to explain last week, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's lots of different problems of evil. Okay, one problem of evil is about how we can overcome evil uh, in our in our own lives and our societies but then there's also the inter there's this intellectual problem of evil of whether or not well of how the existence of evil that we see is compatible with the sort of god we might believe in as christians so really in this series of talks those are, that's the kind of the question i'm exploring and that's the angle i'm i'm consider i'm i'm considering that the, the, yeah, the problem but of evil I feel that I feel that addressing the intellectual problem of evil in that way is there's a presupposition there that that God somehow should be responsible for either preventing or solving the evil that exists. It's a problem because of the way we're phrasing the question. So, Helen, I mean, take take evils for which. So, I mean, there are a lot of evils for a start which humans just aren't responsible for at all. I mean, they couldn't have been. So, for example, like take take dinosaurs getting wiped out by meteorites. That's an example I used last week. Like humans definitely weren't responsible for that. And uh, certainly, you're right that human choices and actions exacerbate many of the evils which we experience. But e even I think in a, in a much more just and or even perfectly just and equitable society, there would be the evils of of disease. There would be some problems with accidents, with natural disaster, and so on. So, yeah, certainly, I, I very much appreciate your 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 insight and your uh, um, yeah your your comment there that the, the really there could be a lot that we could be doing um, about evil, and certainly that we that we should be. But I just my feeling is that um, the behind all of you know, despite all of that, I, I do think that uh, somebody who doesn't believe in God might legitimately question whether or not god god's existence is compatible even with the the evil which we don't cause even, even if that is um maybe less than we we imagine it to be um yeah but that that's how was so i'm sort of exploring the, the problem in this in this talk um in any case but yeah that's not to, that's not to say that it's not very important to, to overcome evil in all the ways in which we've mentioned sorry uh, yeah uh, and then we'll, we'll move me to a final question Helen. um so the, the kind of evils you've described, the sort of the meteorites and the dinosaurs and disease and things like that, are described as evil because of our perspective on those things. So, you know, disease is seen as evil because of the way it impacts on us and our understanding and the way we view it. But a bacteria acting in the way a bacteria is supposed to act is that bad is that evil if, if if a bacteria is just doing what a bacteria was created to do or if a meteorite was just doing what a meteorite was created to do it, it becomes evil because of the value judgment we place on it yeah i'm not quite sure i agree with that helen i think i'm inclined to think that um well let me just say one thing then but i so this is an interesting way of responding to the problem of actually we'll look at it more next week so we'll we'll be able to discuss it more more than I think. Um, but here's one reason I think maybe not to be happy with that kind of um, explanation of, of what evil is. Um, we, we learn in the book of Revelation that there won't be pain and, and crying and death in the final part of, of God's plan and his creation. Um, now, it, it of course, that's not absolutely inconsistent with the idea that, okay, 
God, you know, really pain and suffering and death and all those things aren't bad even now. Okay, it's just that they're not going to be there. But I think a natural way of reading scripture is that somehow there's, there's going to be an improvement. Somehow these facets of our experience of suffering and death and the evil, though, no, those really are bad things and that they're going to be removed because they're bad by by God. In fact, I can't, you know, most fundamentally sort of the story of Jesus's triumph over their death does, I think, assume that there is something bad about death, something which isn't isn't quite right or or, or what God wants. So I'm, I, personally, I'm, I don't think I'd, I'd, in, I'd endorse that answer. But as I say, it's one that you can give and one which we'll, we'll maybe explore a little more next week. Um, we're, we're at half eight now, so I should really um, we should really wrap up i think just to save time but maybe i'll just before we go because i want everybody to have had a chance to ask at least one question um i'll just read sandra your question unless you'd like to read it um may, maybe i'll just read Sam, sandra's question people can probably see it yeah. in there yeah you go ahead that's fine thanks oh sorry sandra yeah sorry okay so sandra sandra writes as well she says um i felt that job seemed a better person at the end of the book uh, because yeah, previously he'd helped widows in their need, but he might have thought that some sin had brought their difficulties on them. At the end of the book, yeah, he learned that bad things he happened even to good people, and it reminded you of the idea of a wounded healer. Um, but as you point out in the process, lots of people died. Yeah, <laughs> Job's family uh, all die, and animals uh, belong to him, and so on. So you might ask what they get out of it, and I think again, this is a really good question. I don't think it's answered in the in the in the book. Um, as I said, um, next week, uh, I, I hope to, to, to cover this today, but next week I'm going to look at a slightly different than way of reading the, the book of Job, one which is less optimistic about giving us answers. Um, all I will say <laughs> is that um, in her own book, on book in which, amongst other things, she, and other biblical stories, she explores the story of Job. Eleanor Stump asks this question too, and all she says is, well, presumably their suffering helped them too. Um, you might or might not find that a very convincing uh, answer. Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really big problem um, for for any attempt to explain uh, Job's suffering and the and the problem of evil is that whatever benefit Job gets some out of it, it looks like God ends up instrumentalizing however many people and animals, uh, thousands of animals and lots of lots of people have uh, Job's family. So I think that's a really big problem too. Um, all right, I'm really sorry that, that the timings for this session hasn't worked out quite so much. Um, what I really learned is I need to make doubly sure that I've got my, my phone next to me next time so I know how much time is passing. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed exploring a Job a little bit or are beginning to explore Job's text. We'll continue exploring Job's text and possibly, we'll, we'll see, I don't want to be too ambitious about timing if, in case we have a repeat of tonight, but um, possibly uh, some text from Isaiah uh, as well, either next week or, or the week after. Um, so excellent. Um, so please, I know I, I'm really sorry I haven't had time to answer everybody's comments or questions at the end. If you do have comments or questions, as before, please feel free to email them through to me and I'll do my best to get to get back to you. I've tried to reply to everybody, although I wasn't able to say nearly as much as I wanted to last week, but please do uh, send things through and I'll try my best. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, thanks so much. Um, thanks, we'll, Greg. We'll, I'll just uh, lead us perhaps in saying a glory be. Um, and then uh, we wish good night to everybody. Excellent. Oops, sorry, I'm muting myself. Glory be to the Father, Father and to the Son, oh, and, to, and the to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And in the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, good night, everybody. I'm very sorry about the timing, but I hope you enjoyed the rest of your evening. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.